and thank you for inviting me to be part of this OECD hearing on abusive dominance in digital markets. In my remarks, I want to focus on the importance of thinking about the demand side, the behavior of consumers when analyzing abuse in these markets. I think that consumers have always been important to how competition works, but understanding consumer behavior has never been so much at the heart of abuse cases uh, before now. Um, and uh, so I wanted to just really focus on that. So let me share my screen. The first thing I just wanted to remind us of is how competition works in theory. Um, and really, it's important to remember that it's essentially a kind of virtuous circle with suppliers on one side of the circle and consumers on the other side of the circle. And in competition cases, we have got a habit of focusing on the supply side. So we think about making sure we have enough suppliers, whether they compete effectively without barriers to entry. But actually competition will only work effectively and only deliver good outcomes if the demand side is also working well, if you have active informed customers buying the products which offer them the best value for money. Um, and if you don't have that, you can get dampened competition because for example, if suppliers offer a better product, consumers don't necessarily switch because they aren't very active and informed. That clearly reduces the incentives for suppliers to actually offer better products. So competition can be dampened. Competition can also be distorted if consumers are choosing on the basis of characteristics that are not those that actually they care about the most, suppliers will actually be competing to deliver those characteristics that consumers are focused on, not necessarily those that are what they really care about. And of course, suppliers can also gain this. So uh, suppliers can potentially make a, create choice architectures within which competition is more distorted than it need be. So um, that's just a very brief introduction to how competition works in theory. And now I want to think about why this demand side may not work as effectively as you might think. And a key reason is that we as consumers all have natural biases um, and we have plenty of biases, but I think the most important ones to highlight in the context of uh, abuse cases are our tendency, our bias to carry on as before, even when there may be better options on the table. So that's something a uh, typical key bias there is status quo bias. Uh, a bias to do the easiest, the most obvious, apparently the most attractive, Thing, even if it isn't actually the best thing. And the sorts of biases that are relevant there are default bias, saliency bias. We have a natural bias to engage in nested decision making. So it can be very, very hard to decide too many things at once. We're not very good at information overload and choice overload. So what we tend to do is package decisions up into individual decisions that we can do in a sequential way. But of course, once we've made a first decision, that sometimes limits the decisions we have to make later on. That's why we do it, but it also means that in the end, uh, we may not make the optimal decisions, but we might uh, make a satisfactory decision. Essentially, we're satisficing. And a fourth bias is that actually, we tend to think even less clearly in the face of complexity, um, time pressure that can make consumers um, or anyone uh, make less good decisions and also, also social pressure. We want to be part of a community. We want to do what our peers suggest is a good thing. All of this means that our choices as consumers can be really strongly influenced by the choice architecture we face, face the way in which decisions are presented to us. And I also just want to emphasize there's really strong evidence on these biases. So theoretically, we shouldn't really have to keep proving them anew in every case. Um, however, for the moment, actually thinking about the demand side in this sort of a way is sufficiently new in antitrust that we probably are going to have to keep proving uh, them in every case. But in the end, I would hope that that wasn't, um, wasn't necessary. 
So what are some of the implications for anti-competitive conduct? I think the first one is that in general, firms can dampen or distort competition through designing their choice architecture. So, um, uh, and clearly inherent biases can be exacerbated through obfuscation, um, over complexity, tricks to increase the pressure. So saying that you're running out of time to make a decision and user steering. So the, the way in which um, the choice architecture uh, leads consumers down particular tracks using defaults and things. More specifically, firms can also exploit these biases to protect their core market or leverage their position across markets. So for example, um, you, could, uh, you can gain competitive advantage through a default position um, and the Google Android case uh, in the EC is a nice example of that and the DOJ filing against Google that's just come out is also a good example. If you look in that filing the word default um, is used 74 times in 64 pages. The word bias is never used but actually the discussion is effectively all about the fact that consumers tend to stick with the defaults that they're presented with. And that is what's underpinning the, uh, the, the filing. Um, and likewise, and this is where the Google Shopping case comes in, you can uh, self-preferencing through user steering can be really highly effective when consumers exhibit things like saliency bias. So they tend to go with the thing that's in front of them rather than scrolling down or go clicking onto another screen to find what might be the best option. Um, so that's kind of very whistle stop. I thought it was just worth highlighting some of the evidence that then gets used on these sorts of topics in practice. Um, so in the Google Android case, the key question that the, com well, the European Commission was looking at really was, does this default status for Google search within um, Android have a foreclosing effect because after all, there are lots of other search engines available. Can consumers can always switch if they want to and there's no cost, um, there's no price advantage, all these things are free. So surely, is it really a problem to have default status? Well, actually, yes, it is, as the commission concluded. And they concluded that on the basis of lots of research showing the existence of default bias generally. The fact that Google was actually willing to pay $1 billion for default status on the iPhone or on Apple products, which is um, part, actually forms part of the DOJ case. Um, and also uh, this evidence on um, Yahoo, Yahoo's obviously a less popular uh, search engine, but when it was made the default on Firefox, it actually kept a, it, it did lose, it didn't manage to get Google levels of market share, but it kept much higher market share on Firefox through being the default. So basically that default status, even if you're not a particularly popular uh, search engine can really, really help you. Similarly, what sorts of evidence was presented in Google Shopping? Here, the key question was actually, uh, does it, uh, are these comparison sites, so the allegation was that Google created this shopping box, um, which uh, had Google's own search comparison shopping service results within it, and then put the other comparison search offerings further down the natural search results. And the question was, does that matter? Because actually, if consumers like these comparison search engines, surely they'll just go and find them. Does it matter that they're further down the Google search results? And this is um, the evidence that essentially shows there is saliency bias. So prominence really does matter. Um, the first one on the left hand side is evidence showing that the top results uh, really have a far higher click-through rate on Google than those later ones. And once you get down to the ninth or tenth result, your click-through rate has fallen off dramatically. Um, at the bottom of the slide is something called the visibility index. And this shows how the visibility index in similar terms of these uh, of the key price comparison site rivals really fell off 
um, uh, after the shopping box was introduced. And then finally, you see the total traffic going through these services um, over this period. And clearly, actually the total traffic using a shopping box at all, or using a shopping service at all, dramatically increases. So arguably that's a good thing. Um, well, arguably, um, but you see the competing comparison shopping services really losing out over that period in relative and in absolute terms. So that's the kind of evidence you get. The final thing I wanted to touch on was the implications of all this for remedy design. I think the key point is that choice architecture really matters, but it can be hard to get right. Um, and Google Shopping provides a salutary example. So from September 2017, to resolve antitrust concerns, Google opened up its shopping box to rival choice comparison services. So they were able to bid for space in this shopping unit. In March 2019, so a year and a half later, Commissioner Vestaya um, accepted that it has taken time for the mechanism to show results, but reflected positively on recent changes that she thought would help, including a feature to allow users to toggle between the current window that shows links going directly to merchants and a window that would show links to comparison sites. The concern being that actually because links were going directly to merchants, consumers didn't even know if they were using a comparison site. So it wasn't really helping those comparison sites um, build up their service. By November, 2019, not much later, she admitted, the proposal does not seem to be doing the trick. We may see a show of rivals in the shopping box. We may see a pickup when it comes to clicks for merchants, but we still do not see much traffic for viable competitors when it comes to shopping comparison. So this is two years later and we are, have the commissioner admitting that her remedy isn't really working. Why is this all so hard and what can be done? Um, I think one point here is that actually any process of bidding for these positions uh, is for default and salient positions has its problems. So it can be exploitative. Essentially, Google is exploiting its bottleneck position and it's extracting most of the rents uh, available. Um, but also any sort of bidding mechanism will tend to favor those that can gain market power from monopolizing a market. If Google is in the best position to monopolize the market, it will actually have the incentive to pay the most for the links and keep that monopoly. Um, and also in this particular situation and in any situation, if you're vertically integrated into the thing that you're bidding to access um, and therefore you get some of the return from your from any bid, obviously you may be more inclined to bid higher because you get a share of that back. Um, so the, the a bidding process can also favor vertically integrated services. So you may not be surprised that this isn't working that well because it's a bidding process. It's also slightly an antithesis to what a price comparison website should be because a price comparison website should really rank on the on the basis of best price, not on the basis of who is willing to pay most to get a ranking, which could arguably work in exactly the opposite direction because it drives prices up rather than down. So that's a basic problem with bidding based competition type solution. But even on the basis that of what they're trying to do, I think the key point here is that consumer biases remain really strong. If the default that consumers see shows links to merchants, if you were going to toggle to get links to price comparison sites, it's just not in consumer's nature. If you change the default, then actually it might work more effectively. Um, there's also, I think, a lack of understanding about the nature of the shopping box. It really is an advertising space, not a price comparison service, as I've just described, uh, you know, it's about you, you get higher by bidding the most, not by offering the best price. Um, but I don't think that consumers necessarily understand that, even though it does now say add at the top of it. Um, I think a key point, and actually the commission has been very good on this, is that these remedies, that remedies that are designed to improve consumer choices with a view to driving more effective competition, really need careful testing, A-B testing, randomized control trials, um, and ongoing monitoring. And the commission, to their credit, do keep going back and looking, deciding things aren't working, and asking Google to come up with something different. 
But this is um, just one example. And I just also highlight that and it's effectively turning DG Comp into a regulator. Um, and it's one reason, therefore, why I think ex ante regulation may, in the end, have advantages over antitrust, um, just for monitoring and enforcing these sorts of remedies. To conclude, I think antitrust and industrial organisation more generally have long focused too much on supply side barriers to entry and competition and uh, assumed broadly rational consumers. I think the growing focus on real consumer biases has brought a much needed uh, focus on the role of the demand side in competition. I think the issues associated with biases are really prevalent in digital platform markets. They're increasingly playing center stage in cases, um, and that's good um, and important. Um, the, but the remedy design and implementation can be almost as difficult, if not more difficult, as, ringing, as winning the original case. And finally, my focus here has been on antitrust, but these demand side issues also highlight the importance of considering competition policy and consumer policy together, and perhaps uh, in digital privacy policy too. Um, so that's all, thank you very much.